So uh, everybody that's listening or watching on YouTube, uh, welcome back to another episode of the Hunter's Advantage podcast. This is actually episode five zero, episode 50 for us. Um, and at the Hunter's Advantage, uh, just what we want to do is educate hunters and uh, share hunting with the world. Um, today, we're joined by my friend Chad Allen Jones. Uh, Chad, thanks for jumping on the podcast with me. How's it going? Oh, man. It's awesome, brother. How about you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Hanging in there during COVID season, uh, doing all that things. We had a nice preamble uh, about you know dfw possibly moving uh jujitsu all that good stuff and now we get to talk about maybe the third passion which is a uh, you know hunting looking forward to it man i think one thing i neglected to ask you uh, the last time um we podcasted which has probably been i don't know a year and a half or two years now mm-hmm. um you know how'd you get started just with hunting and, and you know more particularly i guess bow hunting uh well i mean I really didn't have an option to start hunting. Um, my dad was dragging me into the woods about four years old. Um, and so, you know, he would take, every time he would go, he used to hunt, hunt like uh, Crockett national forest. You're probably familiar with that. Mm-hmm. Um, used to hunt it a lot, just a lot of, um, you know, public land. And so he would take me and my brother when we were, when we were little and he would basically take like a camouflage, uh, tarp and wrap it around us we'd sit on the ground while he'd hike up in the tree and and uh, you know i mean that's just that's all we knew you know during hunting season growing up and you know we loved it it was just um you know it, it just became a passion of just you know watching my dad do it and and um you know then you know watching him you know get an awesome buck or you know get a hog or, or whatever you know that that he's hunting it was just you know the experience of it seeing him gut it i mean just the whole process of it watching him from packing to you know thinking through the process how long we're going for to you know what all he puts in there making sure he's prepared for every weather situation it was just you know so that kind of got ingrained in me just seeing it over and over and over again um you know and then um you know and then i i got a i got a rifle um i don't know i was probably around I don't know, eight, nine years old, something like that. And, um, shot a lot of pigs at that time. uh, Right. Just cause deer hunting was a, was a little bit tougher for me, but, uh, I guess I shot my, I guess I shot my first buck, um, with a 30, 30 that my dad had gotten for me for Christmas. Um, I guess I was probably 10 and, um, and then I switched over to bow hunting, um, I guess that was probably 13 years old, mm-hmm. 13, 14. And, um, man, that was, that was a rough spell. <laughs> that, that, was, that was a game changer right there. You know, when you're that young and you're impatient and, um, you know, it just, it, it was a humbling experience because even the, even the dumbest of deer weren't giving me a chance, you know? So I, I went on a pretty, pretty long spell. I, I'd say I probably shot my first, probably shot my first buck with a bow when I was maybe this was around probably 18. Somewhere. Oh, it took that long. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it was rough. So, man, but you know, it, it, to me, it just made that moment that much better, you know, because you just go year after year and you're like, Oh man, this is hard or you miss or, you know, they win you or whatever, you know, you just learn from those mistakes, but um, you know, just, the reality of, of trying to get a deer within bow range. And of course at that time I'm, you know, relatively new to it. Um, and so the comfort zone of being able to shoot out, you know, 30, 40 yards really wasn't, wasn't there. It was like, man, I need this thing to be like 15, 20 yards. Cause I'm yeah. shaking and nervous and, you know, you don't have any confidence in your shot cause you've never done it before, you know? And so it, uh, it, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty long run, but man, once, once I got the, the first buck down, it, it was over. I, I, I very rarely, uh, use my gun unless it's, you know, um, unless it's somewhere it's wide open terrain that just doesn't really have, you know, the options of, of bow hunting. But if I had, if I had a choice at that point, it was bow hunting over, over gun hunting for sure. Yeah, I think we probably had a pretty similar experience then. Um, you know, I think I was around 12 or 13 when I killed my first deer with a bow. It took, you know, started hunting at, at about eight. And it took those five years to be like, okay, what's what's next in hunting, you know? Um, not that I was just a 
dead eye dick with a rifle or anything. I definitely wasn't. Um, but I got a hammy down bow that had a single old Browning pin on it. Like an, an old site, uh, it had one pin. So my max, uh, yardage was literally 10 yards. And I remember deer standing at 17 yards or 20 yards. And I'm like, God, they're just so far away. Right. I'm just never going to get a shot at one of these. And I had a fawn come in that had probably just lost its spots. <laughs> and it came into the, it came into the 10 yards in the corn pile and when I got drawn back, I was like, I cannot believe this is about to happen. And it took me all year. And it's, uh, it's mom is standing at like 10 or probably like 17 yards, just like staring at me like, what are you doing walking into that porn pile? Um, but I remember releasing that arrow and watching it go 50 yards and fall over. And I was like, man, I'm hooked. That that's was my first experience. What was your first experience shooting a, a deer with a bow? Was it, was it a buck or a doe or what did it look it, like? Uh, it was a buck. I had actually shot a lot of pigs um mm -hmm. just because obviously um the areas that we live in is just infested with pigs and so you know I'd, I'd shot quite a few pigs um you know with my with my gun obviously and then a few with my with my bow but my first buck was uh we had a uh, lease in tishmingo oklahoma and um and so i had a buck come in and um and like I say, this, this was my, this was my first crack at one. He comes in and he was about 30 yards, or at least I guess this is part of the experience that it <laughs> learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, he come in at 30 yards and um, in, instead of ranging him, you know, I, I had ranged some of the trees, like, you know, before I got in the stand, uh, just in terms of like where the feeder and all that was, but I didn't think to range like trees, like, pretty much all the way around me just as a point of reference I just kind of did the ones right in front of me in the shooting lane and and so anyway this buck comes in about 30 yards and I could tell he kind of hangs up and he's he's not coming to the feeder and so he kind of turns starts walking off a little and so I was like man I'm gonna I gotta take the shot so I, I just guessed at this point he had walked to about 35 yards and so you know I sink it right in between my 30 and 40 and I guess I just missed you know, I just misjudged the the distance and I ended up shooting him a little bit high. So mm -hmm. I watch him run off with the, with the arrow, like way up. I mean, almost spined him. And, um, anyway, so I, you know, wait a little bit, get down and there's tons of blood. I was like, okay, this thing's bled to death for sure. And, um, anyway, and so I was kind of going through following the blood trail and he, he loops back, gets up on this ridge. Well, I walk up there and I see him underneath the cedar tree and he jumps up, takes off running. Well, oh, so, no. go, so, yeah, so I go to the cedar tree and the arrow, I guess he had laid down and pulled it out. And so the arrow was laying on the ground and there was a huge pool of blood. And so I go back to the, to the camp, tell my dad, I was like, man, I got a buck. He ran off this way. I watched which way he went, you know, blah, blah. And, um, Anyway, so we all go back, you know, a couple hours later, look for him, never found him. Oh, no. And so that would have been my first buck. So it made it even more heartbreaking to not find him. And um, and so then on that same lease, um, a little bit later, I ended up shooting um, a really nice chocolate horned eight point. And, um, you know, and so it, it kind of redeemed itself. But whenever he was coming in, I had made sure I arranged everything around me. I arranged him. <laughs> you know, when he come in. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things to where it happened when you're bow hunting, I mean, anything can happen. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen deer get shot with a rifle and people never find them. So they're just resilient animals. And so that shot placement's critical, but it's, um, so my, my first, first deer, um, is dead somewhere, but, yeah. uh, but the one I actually have, have at home, which is my first deer, it's, um, you know, it's, I'm proud of it. It's, it, I mean, he didn't score the highest. I'd say he was maybe a 140 inch deer, um, mm -hmm. maybe high one thirties. Uh, I've never even had him scored, but, um, you know, I was, I couldn't have been more proud of that deer. Yeah. No, but, any but deer with a bow. Buck, yeah. My first buck ever was, was, um, was with, uh, with, with a rifle down at Crockett national forest. And that, I guess I was about 10. So it sounds like you had a good mix of maybe public and private hunting. And growing up in the Tishomingo, Oklahoma, 
I, I, I know that like I, in my mind, I've heard that so many times. Where is that? And if, and also is that the, is that the place where Blake Shelton hunts similar, like an area close to you guys? Yeah. So, so our place used to back up next to, or one of our leases used to back up next to uh, Blake's place. Hmm. And, um, and so um kind of it was kind of a running joke that he shoot was shooting all of our all of our big deer yeah all your big ones he shot some monsters but um but yeah so if you go um you know if you're leaving dallas going straight down 75 um you cross over the red river it's just a little bit northwest um i mean it's not like say it's not even an hour and a half past the red river so is What's the, what's the terrain like in Tishomingo? So like, I know you've hunted a lot of the Southeast Oklahoma stuff. It's like pines, right? What's this? Yeah, it's like? complete opposite. You know, how yeah. you're Southeast Oklahoma, you know, like antlers, push all the areas you're used to. It's got big rolling hills and basically small mountains and, and pines and cedars. Um, Tishomingo's polar opposites. Uh, you know, a lot of hardwood trees, um, cedar trees, flatlands, some big, um, kind of some, uh, you know, big boulders and rock type, um, terrain, a lot of, um, like CRP type, um, vegetation. It, it's, um, uh, ju just crazy how just a couple hours difference, the, the landscape is, is so different, but there's some, there's some big deer that, that come out of Tishomingo area. Yeah. We, uh, I think that's getting more towards like the Lawton Snyder, you know, part of the state and, uh, I've got some buddies that are from Snyder, which is a, I guess, 20 minutes about North of Lawton. It's like Southwest corner and it's like really rocky. There's mountains, all kinds of stuff. And it's crazy. You can go from one part of the state in the Western, it's got mountains. And then you go to another one. It's like pine mountains, just in a completely different way. Right. Right. So how did, uh, I know you're a Southeast Oklahoma guy too, even though you're a, a Texas native, um, you know, how'd you get started hunting Southeast Oklahoma? You know, that, you know, that big pine, open, bit, a lot of timber, very little open area, that kind of stuff. It, it's pretty tough with a bow. Why'd you get it? Why'd you get started doing that? Well, so how I even started hunting, um, Oklahoma in general was, um, all of my mom's side of the families from Southern Oklahoma, mm. uh, all around Tishomingo, Wapanucka, Atoka. Um, and so, you know, I was going up there, you know, for family reunions, spending summers, just things like that. Um, so that's kind of where it got started. Um, you know, was going and fishing, wading out in Blue River, setting trot lines, all that stuff. Um, you know, fishing out in the Washita River, things like that. And then when hunting season would come, you know, I'd go hunting with my grandfather, which, you know, they had some family owned land um, that that was over next to the Mayhard chicken farm. And, um, and man, there were some really, really good deer out there. And so that's what generated me going and hunting basically every year with him, um, you know, to hunt Oklahoma. Well, so we ended up liking hunting Oklahoma so much that that's when it turned into, well, hey, let's find some, uh, some public land, you know, that we'll be able to hunt as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, when we started kind of looking around for places to go, we're like, what's within a, you know a normal driving distance especially being public land you know that we can we can hunt and so that was when we found like the atoka and stringtown area and um and then hunted that for years but like I say i know we were trying to trying to uh you know hook up together and go on a on a hunt down there and i actually haven't been back up there mm -hmm. since we last talked to you it's just been a whirlwind it's been crazy um so i haven't even had a chance to go but um man i love i love hunting the you know, right at the edge of the Kaimishi mountains right there. And, the, yep. you know, that, that steeper terrain, it just, it changes things, you know, it changes your wind, your thermals, a lot, a lot of stuff you don't have to think about in terms of hunting the flat ground is a whole lot different when you start getting into the mountainous terrains or big hills as, you know, some, some would call it, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoy it. The, the methods and the challenges of, of hunting public land is, you know, why I still enjoy going and doing it. Just, it just makes it a little, makes it a little tougher, you know? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, so we had a lot of success in Southeast Oklahoma last year. Um, I shot a good buck on public. One of my buddies actually shot a 162 inch deer on public. Yeah. I saw and, man. You guys, the toad, man, that's awesome. 
Yeah, the taxidermy bill is going to be big this year. I mean, which is a good, it's a good issue to have. Right. Um, but, you know, we have so many people that ask us about hunting public. And, um, you know, I want to ask a guy like you that's had some success on public too. You know, what what are you trying to do? What are your strategies when you're a, approaching a you know piece of public? Is it a lot of map scouting? Or are you hanging trail cameras? What are you doing to, you know, prepare? Obviously, in a year, not like COVID, when you actually have time to go down there and hunt. Oh, uh, well... I mean, it depends if I'm, if I've been to the place before, then I, you know, I've kind of already done, you know, I've, I've looked at my topo maps. I've, I've kind of pinpointed some areas I want to look at. And then obviously I go in and, and check those and see if it's, you know, what I'm thinking that it should be. If it's a place I've never been before, then, you know, nothing beats, you know, boots on the ground. It's, you know, mm -hmm. you can look at the maps and, you know, and obviously once you learn how to read them, you can tell where there's, you know, topography changes and, you know, thick trees versus not. And, um, but it's, um, you know, so I always just start with a, with an aerial map of it for one, getting familiar with the boundaries, the locations, um, you know, kind of the depth of the property, you know, how deep I can go. Um, you know, I don't want to really be on any fence lines because I don't know what it is about fence lines. Everybody loves to hunt them. And so if you hunt on a fence line, you're going to run into somebody at some point on, um, on public land. And so, you know, I look at the maps, I kind of look at some of the terrain features that, you know, the habitat features where it goes from, you know, from thick edges to, to kind of open edges. And I'll focus on some of those, but I want to, I want to focus on the ones that are a little harder to get to because if it's easy access, everybody's going to go to those first, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll check those areas. I'll obviously check it for water, check it for food sources. Um, you know, and, um, and those will typically kind of tell you where the, where the bedding areas are going to be. Cause you'll see the trails come back and forth and kind of, you know, filling you in which direction they're going, but, um, it just, you just kind of have to get out there and do it. You know, it's going in and just sitting and hoping for the best. Uh, is typically what you end up doing is just sitting there and hoping for the best. It's, um, yeah. and it depends how, how pressured it is. Um, you know, cause you might find public land where there's not a lot of hunting pressure and, you know, you'll pass some deer and they just kind of look at you like, you know, what are you doing here? And then others, it can be the slightest thing and they're gone or gone before you even see them, you know, and then you're like, man, there's no deer out here. Um, you know, so it, it just, there's, a, it's a kind of a accumulation of a lot of things that you kind of have to factor in, but, um, I don't know that there's really one, one specific thing other than I just, I have to look at a map, you know, mark the areas that I want to go check. Cause if it's a, if it's a huge spot boots on the ground, you might be walking that thing for a week and never see it all, you know? So right. I, I want to be as efficient as possible. I'm looking for areas that look like cover. I'm looking for, you know, trees that appear that they might be uh, pecan trees, oak trees, you know, something like that. Um, and normally on maps, you can kind of go back on your date stamp, you know, like, uh, like on Google earth. And you can, a lot of times you can tell the hardwood trees um, on there because, you know, some pictures will take and they won't have leaves on the trees and it'll look thinner and things like mm -hmm. that. And so, um, you know, and then I just kind of focus in mark those. And then I just go, I just go out there and, and check. And that's really all, you know, that's really all you can do. I know a lot of guys like running cameras, but if it's on public land and they probably not going to last long. No, if somebody comes across them, they're definitely not going to last right. very long. No, we haven't had a huge issue with people taking them, but I, I know people do. Um, yeah. We've lost a couple. I mean, are you, when you're going in on a, you know, say a weekend hunt or anything, are you just walking in and doing hanging hunt? Are you putting a stand on your back or are you doing a climber? I know that's kind of easy in that area of the world to do. Um, depends. Uh, I, I kind of do it all, um, because just say like in, um, you know, in Stringtown, for, for example, you've got kind of some of the lower areas, like basically your, your 100 elevation or your, you know, flat elevation, uh, you know, it's got some CRP and, and some cedars and, uh, and, and then it kind of transitions to, uh, pines as you get up on the elevations. So, um, you know, I might have to do, 
you know, climbing sticks and, and a lock on on the lower elevations uh, and then use a climber on the higher elevations. Um, and then sometimes I might use a ghost blind, you know, on some areas that don't have good trees, at least in terms of the wind versus where I'm trying to sit. Uh, and it's a perfect scenario for me because, you know, you can sit in that CRP and I mean, it's, I mean, you're pretty much disappearing in it, but it's obviously people like being up high so they can see a long ways too. And so I, I kind of use the combination of them all. I, I, I normally take all of those stands and then I, I'm, I, I keep it as mobile as I can, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause when pressure hits, those deer might kind of repeat something all the time and they see one human walking through there and that, that pattern gets disrupted pretty quick. So um, I kind of, I kind of use all of those <laughs> strategies. Yeah, no, each one of them has a, a time and a place. I, f I feel like w one thing that you talked about uh, was the idea of, I don't think you called it this, but it's what kind of what I call it is like a, it's one of the strategies we use um, when hunting public is like identifying like hard edges. So places where, you know, um, timber, maybe mature timber meets like a clear cut or, um, a really high grass, um, they kind of meet and create an edge, right? And those deer love to travel down those edges. Is that similar to what you guys are hunting? Is that something you're looking for on the maps? Yeah. If there's uh, old logging roads, clear cuts, mm -hmm. um, access roads for like oil sites. I mean, anything that cuts through the timber, most of the time deer are going to ideally I mean, you always hear they want to take the path of least resistance. So if there's a road, a lot of times I'll walk down the road, but I normally always see more mature bucks staying on that edge. They, they, they want to feel as safe as they can, even though they might not be walking on the road or on the clear cut, they're right on the inside tree line of it. Um, and so it depends if, if it's a, if it's a clear cut or something that people are using as an access point, then I won't hunt on it. Um, just because the time that I'm there, there might not be anybody there hunting, but if there's been weekends or weeks previous before there's been hunters in there, well, those deer get pretty savvy to that savvy to that. And, and most of the time they're not coming through there in daylight hours. Um, you know, if they've been running into people or they smell or sit on the ground or they've been going in there. So it just kind of depends how early in the season it is um because you know what we ran into for oklahoma is we basically had about three weeks well about four weeks um to make it happen up there in archery only season because muzzleloader hits you know basically the week of of halloween and mm -hmm. man it was crazy it's like a light switch with the deer out there i mean you'll see them everywhere in october and all those gun hunters come from muzzleloader and it's the bucks you might have seen in the places that you were seeing them it's uh the mature ones go nocturnal and, and you a lot of times you won't see those until you know for another two three weeks um you know until um you know until the rut's starting to kick off which you know up in that area is is typically around you know the 15th through thanksgiving time frame somewhere around there is normally when we see the peak of the rut happening. Yeah. That's one thing I, I really dislike about Oklahoma seasons is like, as soon as, as the, as the rut or the pre-rut starting to ramp up in late October, boom, they smack it with a nine day muzzleloader season. <laughs> you get to hunt a few days as the ruts even starting to peak up more and the deer haven't been hunting with a muzzleloader and then boom, they smack a two week rifle season in it. Right. It's like, when are we going to switch to one of these models where if you want to hunt with a gun, I'm not, I mean, I love that people hunt, but, let's make it a late season thing like right. a, you know, a you know, December 15th through 31st and make it a little bit harder because it's like, especially since it's a two buck, uh, you know, uh, it's a two buck state. Oh, so you can yeah. walk in, shoot one with your muzzleloader two weeks later, go shoot one with your rifle. And it's, man, that's frustrating, especially right. during the, during the peak of the season. Yeah, no, I, uh, I know what you mean. So a lot of times we would just have to plan our trips around, trying to go in, get scouting done and try to get one on the ground before muzzleloader started because, um, you know, once that started, then it kind of rolls over to, to rifle season, you know, then you're, then you're left with that wrapping up and then, you know, you're coming into to Christmas and, uh, and then I, th I think it's right now, it's like the 15th of January. So, you, you know, you got, 
three weekends into January that you can still hunt. But then at that point, I mean, there's nothing patternable unless you have a food source, you know, because now it's getting cold. Every, every, all the acorns have rotted out, pecans rotted out, vegetation's all died. So now you're going, okay, I need to be hunting a food source. And the problem is you're on public land and there's normally not anybody's like food plot, you know, right growing in the middle of it and, and and so then at that point now you're looking to the edges of the property line because there might be a neighbor that has you know an ag field or something that's still you know got some sort of food source on it that you might be able to hunt you know on a fence line there trying to catch them transitioning in but um you know it just it's it's kind of one of those things if, if we don't get it done before before halloween then yeah you're kind of just you know, hoping for the best at that point. Yeah. December and, and January have been really tough uh, for us on public. And you brought up something really interesting is the idea that, um, you know, in Oklahoma, you can't bait on public. Right. And right. so not only do you not have any food plots, um, you know, they don't really plant very many food plots. They like, they'll mow down a little bit of grass on these WMAs, but they're not planting like actual winter wheat or anything. Mm -hmm. And no one has corn feeders. Right. right. So it makes it like, double as hard and it's just an interesting style of hunting when you're not hunting over any food at all there's no acorns no pecans no food plots no feeders it's just a crazy crazy way of hunting well yeah and and i mean i i enjoy hunting like that i mean it gets about as primitive as it can in terms of what you would really call hunting you mm -hmm. know if you're trying to go in that deer's home uh, you know, in, in their natural food source, their natural cover, and you're trying to outsmart them, you know, and, and get them within, you know, 20, 30 yards and, and kill them. And it's, it's a lot harder than you think. It's, it's a, a different ball game. If you're somewhere up North in a state where they've got, you know, standing corn and, and mm -hmm. soybeans and just, you know, acres and acres and acres of it. Well, at that point, all you're really having to do is get in the transition between bedding and food and i mean you're in the chips at that point so it's um uh, you know so the strategies here are just you know a little the hunting is just a little different you know um you know because i've been up hunting in in illinois and it's crazy i mean the deer just it's just like a beat down trail coming out of bed right. straight to you know an ag field and it's like you just set with the right wind right off of that trail and i mean you're going to get an opportunity at, at something you know if the deer are moving and uh you know but here they could come from any direction there's no rhyme or reason it's just you know where you think they might come from all of a sudden they come from behind you and i mean and and of course you know this too and in, in that terrain that wind swirls really bad yep. and uh you know and so it doesn't matter how high you get up in that tree it's you know it's uh it can make make for an interesting take takes a lot of the skill factor out and puts in a whole lot of luck factor at that point. But, but Hey man, you guys got it done. So that's all yeah, that matters, right. That's right. I mean, it's so crazy because, um, we, we've, we've had people, uh, reach out and be like, man, you guys are killing it. And I'm like, yeah, little do you know that I saw during that week, um, I, we hunted for an entire week. Um, I saw three deer that entire week and shot two of them. <laughs> like, shot a buck the uh, so i shot a doe out of that stand i saw two does the evening before i shot one of them and then that buck came the, down the exact same trail um the night after and i shot it and my buddy had only seen that shot the 162 inch buck he had only seen like three deer too but but we walk out with 131 inch eight point and 162 inch 11 point and it's like man you guys are doing it you know you're doing the thing and i'm like yeah. man you don't understand like we got you say i talk about luck it, it's luck in a lot of ways it's, you know, God planting a deer right there that he wants me to take home because it's really hard to tell, to call it skill in that, you know, when you're hunting like that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of just being in the right place at the right time, especially I mean, when you're on thousands of acres, you know, mm -hmm. those deer could go anywhere, you know, and, and, and it's different if you're hunting a food source because you're going, well, now the deer are going to come to me, you know, yep. but you don't have that luxury uh, you know, if you're sitting on a rub line or sitting on a scrape or you're just sitting on a, you know, a game trail or whatever, you're still at the mercy of them coming by at the right time, you know, um, you know, on the right side with your wind direction and, uh, you know, everything just, you know, coming together. So, 
Hey man, hats off to you guys, dude, because it's it's tough to get it done on on public land, that's for sure. And y'all got some y'all got some good ones on the ground, so I'm I'm happy yeah. for you, man. No, so, we appreciate it, man. It's yeah, it's uh it's so crazy. Um and that you know, you talking about it gets me excited about it again. But um yeah, it's a it's a really cool experience. But you know, just transitioning here a little bit, um, you know, how was this last fall for you? Um I, I know you got a, a really great buck on the ground. What was it like preseason? What were your expectations and how did it end up playing out? Well, you know, it's funny because when we we last uh when we last talked, when you last had me on the show, it was you know, kind of looking forward to the next season and see what happens. And well, um, so anyway, this, this past summer, um, I, uh, you know, I, I've run, um, some pretty high protein, um, mix. I do some corn, but I mix it with some, uh, some soybeans and, um, it's pretty high, high in protein. So I run that pretty much from around April through August, you know, when the, the antlers are, are, um, you know, developing. And, and so I had a, I had a buck come in that, yeah, I mean, I was guessing it's always hard to tell when they're in velvet just cause they look like they have a little more mass, but, uh, I was guessing he was probably pushing around 190, uh, mm-hmm. non-typical. And, um, I mean, he was an absolute stud man. And, and he was coming into that feeder just about like every other day. And of course I was watching, he kept coming in on like a South to a Southeast wind. Um, so, you know, then I'm trying to, trying to, you know, pin down like where he's coming from. And this is early. I mean, this is, you know, he was, um, you know, he started, I started having him come in in like June, July, and then I could see what he was starting to turn into. And I was like, Oh man, this, this guy's going to be something special. And so, uh, the funny part is he was coming into the stand where I shot my 2018 buck. And, uh, so I, I was like, man, I'm obviously not going to lose, lose, uh, or move out on this spot. But anyway, so long story short, um, you know, I was getting excited and getting a little closer, we're getting into August and, uh, start shedding off the velvet. And I'm like, all right, he's been coming in all the time. Where's he at? Well, he just disappears and I'm not seeing him. And I was like, well, you know, he'll, he'll be back. Maybe he's just kind of transitioning a little bit with some of these bucks, you know, uh, rowing the velvet off, and, you know, kind of maybe starting to switch to his home range or, you know, to his fall range or something. Well, never saw him after that. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, at this point I'm puzzled cause I was kind of narrowing down where he was living. I'm pretty sure he was kind of across the Creek, uh, from us and, uh, up on this little high Ridge. So anytime it flooded, you know, he, he's good. Didn't have to move. It was really thick, had hardwoods, had, you know, acorn trees, I mean, had it all for him. So I was fairly confident that's where he was hunting and, or that's where he was living. And so, um, so anyway, well, the, the farmer on that other side of the Creek had cut all of his ag fields about the time we last saw him. So I was like, well, my guess is that's probably what pushed him a little earlier from where, you know, uh, from where he was betting. Well, so long story short, I nicknamed him the phantom buck because like I say, he just disappeared. I uh, never mm-hmm. saw him after that. And I had a buddy um, later in the season that told me his friend had pictures of him on camera about three and a half miles down the Creek from, from where we are. So, uh, so he was my, obviously my target buck. And uh, you know, I, I knew that ship had sailed. I thought he may come back in, you know, during the, during the rut uh, since that was home for the summer, but he never did. And um Anyway, and so transition kind of kind of changed. I actually have uh, three different leases uh, in Collin County, and um, you know, so at this point, I'm just kind of monitoring cameras and and bucks and seeing you know which one's going to be my target buck. Well, I had I had a target buck on on um, one of them that um, he was probably a mid 170 typical. Um, I've actually got his sheds from a couple of years ago, um, but he was almost purely nocturnal. And, um, so I never really hunted that property much just because it was pointless for me to be wasting my time until he starts daylighting. And so then the buck that I ended up shooting, uh, so he was on the property, uh, one of the properties that I'm leasing, um, he was on that property last year as a 10 point. And, hmm. and this year he declined. I mean, he was an older buck. Uh, this year he declined 
and he actually grew back as a nine point. Uh, he had just like a little like, you know, three inch uh, time coming um, between his G2 and G3 that he broke off. And um, so he just looks like a clean, typical, typical eight. But, um, you know, he had had really good mass. And I have two other guys that are hunting with me on that lease. Um, and they were getting quite a few pictures of him. I never had any pictures. Never, mm. Like none. I did last year, but not any this year. And, um, and so I was just kind of puzzled, like, man, why does he not like this spot? You know? And so anyway, they were both after this buck pretty hard. And I'm like, Hey man, hope you guys get after him. I'm not, I'm not in the game on this deal. Cause, uh, you know, I'm not, not seeing him at all. And, um, anyway, so, you know, I'm just at this point, I didn't really have like a, a true target buck. It was like, he was a target if he showed up, but yeah. I wasn't expecting him to. So we started getting into, into November and, um, and I guess it was November. It had been the 16th and 17th. I've got cellular cameras and they both go off on one of my North stands where, you know, I, I don't have anything. There's just a, a, like a winter wheat field that was planted and I'm right on a hard edge um, from a big open field to winter wheat to uh, the hard edge to their bedding area. And um, I had a picture on the 16th of does coming out to feed and he was with them. Well, so I thought, but it was at night. And so mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, okay, well, you know, he's at least on in that area now. Then I get a picture at, I guess it was around 515 on the 17th, the day after. So right before dark, he comes in following the same group of does. And, but this time, like I say, it's still shooting light. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, all my, my, strategy changed because i thought okay he's got to be tending one of these does for one to be walking out in this open field and shooting light so i was like all right got to make a switch hopefully they'll do the, you know a lot of times when they tend to doe you know i mean they'll be on them for you know two three maybe four days so i thought well maybe i'll get lucky and he just started tending her and so it's like i'm gonna go hunt this third day and maybe they kind of repeat the same sequence and uh sure enough you know it's uh you know, sun goes down and I see these uh, does coming up out of this little ravine. And for whatever reason, instead of coming out in the trail in front of me in the corner, they decided to go behind me. And so it was really, really thick. So I couldn't see anything. So I'm sitting there watching, but I could hear something walking behind them. But I just, normally it's a pretty big group of does. And so I didn't really think too much about it. And then sure enough, I'm standing there and the does come out one kind of starts walking down behind me and I was like, Oh, it's game over. She's about to win me, you know, because yeah. the wind was blowing across the open field. And, uh, and so anyway, well, I happened to look down when I could hear something, you know, moving about to come out, out of the, out into the open. And I looked down and it was the big eight point. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and anyway, and so, Anyway, I stand up in the stand, I get turned around and, and the other doe. So luckily some pigs had come out and um, they come out on open the field. Well, so I'm looking at the lead doe and now she's directly downwind. I see her nose go up in the air and I was like, oh no. Here go. <laughs> and he's not in a clear, I don't have a clear shot at him at this point. So I can't do anything. And I'm going, please, please don't let this happen right now. Well, luckily the pigs took her attention off of me. You know, I guess she could she could win me or she could smell me, but I think she was so focused on the pigs mm -hmm. um, that she just kept watching them. She started stomping at them. And anyway, and so then she got nervous and started taking off trotting and he started going in behind her out the open field and, um, you know, and sang a little song and dance, just meh, meh. And I was actually using an air bow this year instead of my regular bow. And, um, and I shot and I just rushed the shot a little and, and hit him high, kind of like right up on the top side of the shoulder, clean pass through, but it was a loud, like it was a loud smack. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh man, it hit some bone, you know, either top of the shoulder blade or bottom part of the vertebrae or something, but full pass through, good blood, tracked it for like probably a hundred yards. And, um, and I was like, man, if he's not down in a hundred yards, I'm going to back out and come back the next morning. And um, so this is where it gets, 
really nutty. So, <laughs> I, so, so I, so I get, so I, I go back the next morning and, um, and, you know, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to document this stuff for like YouTube, you know, yeah. the channel sucks because I'm ter- terrible at editing. I'm terrible at trying <laughs> to remember when to film stuff and not whatever. Yep. But, uh, anyway. And so, um, you know, so I'm trying to document all this stuff. And so I go down there and I'm expecting that I'm going to pick up the blood trail and find this dead deer right in daylight mm-hmm. where I can see. So luckily I happened to grab my arrow and took it with me. And, uh, so I walked down there get to the last blood and I'm looking around, uh, you know, I'd marked it with toilet paper just, you know, so I could find it. And anyway, and so I get down there to the last blood and, and, um, I'm on my hands and knees, like looking for like the next drop of blood. And I hear something like coming through the trees and I look up and it's him. And I was like, is this real life? Like I'm looking (laughs) for this deer to be dead on the ground. And he walks by me at like 40 yards. And he doesn't see me. He's kind of going through some like uh, thick, like ragweed mm-hmm. coming out of this ravine. And um, I'm just like, I'm in shock at this point. And so I can see that, you know, he's not limping. I mean, I can see the hole in the top, you know, in the blood stain, but I'm just like, what the heck, man? And uh, so anyway, he kind of turns and starts walking away from me. And so I was like, all right, well, he didn't know I was here. Obviously he's going to live. You know, so I thought, man, I'll just back out of here real quiet. And, uh, you know, he's obviously still out looking for does. So I thought, man, I'll, I'll get back in here another day or two and um, try to get on him. And anyway, and so I start kind of, you know, trying to stay behind the trees just in case he, for some reason, turns around or whatever and start go out. Well, I happen to hear something else walking. I look over and a, a 10 point is coming down this trail and, uh, and I can tell that he's about to get right downwind of me. And I'm mm-hmm. just like, oh, no, here we go. So I, I kind of hide behind the tree, um, you know, a little bitty tree. Like, I'm still, like, sticking out behind it. And yeah. I, anyway, he gets directly downwind. And he stops, puts his head up, starts looking. And he's like, where is he at? You know, and he starts blowing at me. And um, so he runs off. Well, then another little smaller buck when he started blowing and run, he jumps up and runs off that I didn't even see over there. And, um, and they both run off. They're like blowing like the whole way, like all the way back to the back. And, um, well, so then I hear crashing coming from the way the eight point had, had come or had gone to out of this little ravine. He comes just barreling. I'm talking like running over saplings. I mean, I've never seen anything like it in person. I mean, it's insane. His hair was bristled up. And he just come up over the top of this ridge, like just running over like small trees and just, I mean, on a tear. I mean, it was Mm. was nuts. And uh, his head, like he was just looking around, like his head was whipping around. Uh, He was just trying to find the buck that I guess was in his spot. He's like, dude, why are you, (laughs) why are you in my house? You know? Mm -hmm. So his head's just whipping around and I'm, I'm behind this tree looking at him and he comes all the way up to within like 25 yards of me. And there's a hole like, you know, in the, in the trees about like this. And he, it, he was standing, you know, facing me and he was looking this direction. And uh, so all I had was a frontal shot, like, you know, right mm-hmm. inside the neck. And so I was like, dude, I, I mean, I got to make this happen. And so I ended up shooting. He ran like 50 yards and, uh, and fell over. I mean, I watched him fall over and I was just like, did this really just happen? Like, I mean, I shot this deer twice in two days. I mean, it was, it was, it was insane, but I got, I got really lucky to get him. Um, you know, it's, but how he lived the first time, I have no idea. I mean, it, it was, uh, it was an angled shot. It went through, you know, it went through, clipped the top of basically his left side lung and come out his right side lung and how he, how he lived. I, 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 still confused with that. I mean, cause the hole was massive. Um, and, but it, it was clotted on his, on the side that the exit wound, it was already clotted and, and filled up, but the, the top side, it was still an open wound. And, uh, oh my so gosh. it, um, it was, it was kind of crazy, but I got, got pretty lucky on that one. Um, you know, and then, and then went down and hunted with the wild lifers, um, uh, with Dan and, um, Stephanie Brayman down in uh, Refugio, Texas, um, uh, Refugio or however people pronounce it down there, <laughs> uh, went and hunted with them, opening weekend. That was really awesome. Um, 
South Texas is just a different, different breed. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then just recently went and hunted down at the King Ranch for the first time. Um, and uh, shot a really nice buck there. Couldn't find it. Mm. Uh, center, I mean, center punched him in the lungs and, uh, and it, it went through the lungs on the side that it entered and hit, hit the inside shoulder blade where he was stepping back. Um, yeah. So I didn't get a full pass through. And, um, anyway tons of blood i mean like tons of bloods i mean he he died but it was so thick we couldn't find him and the dogs weren't available so the guys were just like hey man we'll call you you know when we find him you just kind of get him recaped because there's so many coyotes and so that was a heartbreaker um, yeah you know but you know it's that's bow hunting for you man it's, you just never know oh no i've i had that happen a couple times this year already um yeah. or this last season it it absolutely sucks but it sounds like you need a cameraman dedicated to following you around if you're gonna have this crazy on the ground encounters with deer like this. well that was what somebody, they were like they were like so you didn't film it and i was like well no how I would i film it because <laughs> i thought that he was gonna be dead on the ground you mm -hmm. know and uh yeah i, I wish i would have had at least a tactic cam or GoPro or something. Cause I mean, yeah. I was like, you can't even make this up. I mean, and for one, it would have just been unbelievable footage of seeing that, but I mean, I've never seen one come in. Like, I mean, he was wanting to kill somebody. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was crazy, man. That's wild. So what is, I'm not familiar. What's an, uh, an air bow. What, what is that? What's that? What's an air bow. Is that what you said you were using? Uh, so the, an air bow, it's, um, it's called a Benjamin Airbow. It's basically like uh, compressed air. It has like a compressed air tank. Um, yeah, they're starting to get pretty popular now. Um, I, I'm starting to see a lot of a lot of different brands and versions of them. But um, yeah. they just legalized them for our county like two years ago. And um, you know, and so I, primarily before then, when I bought it, um, which was a few years back now, um, I was just shooting you know coyotes and pigs and stuff with it. But they just legalized mm -hmm. to be able to deer hunt with it. Um, I think in, I think you can use them in, in the entire state of Texas now, but I'm not for sure. But I know the county that I was in, um, they just legalized it a couple years ago. And so anyway, it's compressed air and it, it shoots basically, an, it, it looks like a regular arrow, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for your compound bow, but um, it's just, it's got a hollow shaft in it and okay. uh, it slides over the compressed air rod. And so when it, shoots it it doesn't push from the back end it's shooting from the tip of it oh so, that makes sense so, so that it keeps it super accurate so there's no flex in your arrow or anything and it shoots at uh 450 feet per second so it's it's on a rope dude i mean it's like shooting a gun i mean it comes with a scope and um they're 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 pretty sweet it's um hmm. but just as anything i made a bad shot with it because it's like a gun i mean it, you, if you pull i mean if you you know, any little bit of movement and, and the farther out you are, obviously with an arrow, it's, uh, you know, but, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's so fast. You can't even see the arrow. You can't see the shot placement, you know, yeah. um, you, you know, and you can't put lighted knocks or anything on it because the way the, the arrow shaft has to go onto that mm -hmm. tube. So, but, um, but they're, they're pretty, they're pretty sweet. That sounds pretty awesome. It isn't it crazy that something is fast and as efficient as that. It's still, without good shot placement, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I see people, you know, shoot deer with freaking 30 off sixes and never find them. I mean, it's, it's, it's not to say that they didn't go and die, but yeah, how far a deer can run off of very little blood, very little uh, oxygen and a lot of adrenaline is, is mind blowing. It's crazy. I, I shot a, I shot a deer. Well, it's, it was uh, in Southeast Oklahoma this last year. Um, and I, I never made a video about it and I still hate talking about it cause it makes you freaking sick. But, uh, we had a deer sneak up on us at, at about 40 yards. I hit my range finder said 31 yards. And I was like, been hunting way too long enough. That's not 31 yards. Hit it again said 31 yards. I said, all right, maybe I'm just stupid. So I just, I pulled, I put my uh, sight on 31, pulled back shot right under him. I was like, damn it. Was it I knew that. No, no, not really. And I know some of those rangefinders have angle compensation, mm -hmm. right? But we were on a pretty, we weren't very high up in this tree, maybe 12, 15 feet. And it was just, we were on flat ground and I watched my arrows just soar right under him. I was like, gosh, dang it. So he runs out there to 75 yards and stops. And I'm like, 
I mean, I shoot my bow all the time. I see people doing, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to try it. So, and I wouldn't have shot a deer like this if I hadn't already just missed him, but right. I was like, I'm going to shoot at him. So I shot at him at 75 yards and I drilled him. I mean, just drilled him and I could tell it, it kind of got a little bit of the shoulder, but when I hit him, it just sounded like it hit it like a cement wall. And I went and I couldn't find my arrow and I looked all around. I was like, man, this sucks. So then I went and picked up my freaking arrow and, uh, it only got about eight and eight inches of penetration, but, uh, it was, it was money. And we followed a blood trail down in a ravine right back up on the top. And it looked like you were just pouring blood out of a bucket. Right. And I was like, man, this is going to be, this is going to be easy money. And, uh, we had already waited about an hour and a half at this point. I'm like, if I hit this deer, anything like I think I did by this blood trail, he's getting, there's no way he's surviving this in an hour, you know, an hour and a half, two hours time. And, uh, we walk up on this next ravine on one of those hard edges, like we were talking about earlier. And I'm like, he's going to be right in this grass. Just wait. I take one step into the grass and he stands up about five feet from me. And I'm like, Oh my God. And it was on public. And I, uh, Jake's like, no, we're going to find him. We're going to find him. Look, look how he's bleeding. I'm like, dude, this is not how it works with deer. I was like, if you jump him, my confidence goes from about 90% down to about five. And we went back and ate and the whole time I'm kind of upset about it. And, uh, we went back and it went the, the ability from it to go to buckets of blood to a speck in no time. He's making leaps and bounds. We tracked him for another four or 500 yards and never found him. Yeah. And I know that deer is, I know he's dead based, yeah. you know, it's just crazy how resilient they are. And that's, that's my mess up story of this year, man. Everybody at some point will experience that. And, and I, and I won't even say bow hunters in, in general, mm -hmm. uh, although that more, I guess it's more prominent to happen to bow hunters. Um, right. Just because of the amount of damage, um, you know, that, bullets do um but it's you hunt long enough it will happen at, at some point i mean it's just you know it stinks and you hate that but it's just it's part of it you know and you just you just learn from it and yeah move on down the road it's all you can do yeah it's it's crazy to me i i thought when i first started doing this man you know eventually i'll reach a point of efficiency where this will quit happening to me and I've realized that, um, you know, whether a deer ducks or moves or you do something wrong or they wind you or how alert they are, there's just so many factors when you're trying to kill a deer with a sharp stick that um, the odds are not in your favor. And it's it's crazy. Yeah, it, yeah, it really is. I mean, like I say, I mean, the, the King Ranch buck, um, I mean, it was 18 yards. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, dude, it's, I mean, you couldn't have. I couldn't have placed it any better than what I did. And, um, and like say it hit his far side shoulder cause he was eating and he kind of had his, that back far side shoulder back and I yeah. could hear it pop and the arrow didn't go all the way through. And of course I was using an expandable and, uh, uh, should have used a fixed blade, but, um, you know, I don't know that it would have ricocheted off that bone and went through or not, but it was, I was kind of kicking myself thin, but it's, um, you know, it, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm sitting there going, how in the world did this deer just keep going? You know, uh, I mean, I'm talking like, it looks like you, you, it, there was like three pools all right in a row that looked like you just took a paint can and just poured out what was in it, like a five gallon paint can, you know, like mm -hmm. in three spots. I'm like, I mean, he's dead. There's no question he's bled to death. Um, yeah. But the grass was so thick. And what, that's what I told the guys. I was like, man, without dogs, we ain't finding them in here. The only thing you can do at that point is wait for vultures to find them for you. If yeah. they can even see them, you know, it's, it was really, really thick down there, but heartbreaker, you know, but what do you do? Yeah, it's, it's part of it. And if, and people that uh, say it hasn't happened to them and haven't hunted long enough or shot at enough deer, yeah. cause I, I know it happens. It'll happen. Yeah, it'll happen. So Chad, one of the interesting things, um, I think I, I find about you is that, uh, you know, you shot a 233 inch deer, which, you know, for most people that bow hunt or deer hunt at all, that's the Mecca and, you know, going to be hard to replicate in this lifetime and maybe even a couple of lifetimes, but I still see you shooting, you know, 110 inch deer when you go on a trip, you know, what, 
what's the you know what's the rationale behind that? I mean, I think a lot of people will be way too prideful to do that stuff. I mean, but for you, it seems like you're just in it for the hunt. You just enjoy it. You know, why Man, is that? I, I do like it. It's it's crazy. It um that was probably been like the number one question that you know people ask me. Yeah, after I you know shot my biggest year uh, to date is like, well, what do you do now? I mean, you kind of ruined it for yourself because you'll never shoot anything that big again. I was like, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm content with that. And I have realistic expectations. You know right. what I mean? I understand that I'll probably never see another 200 inch deer, much less be within bow range and get the opportunity at one, you know? And, uh, and so it's like, I, I'm fine with that. And, but I'm not going to hold out in hunting, waiting and hoping for another 200 inch deer. Um, mm -hmm. Although last summer I thought I might get <laughs> lucky with one uh, coming in, but you know, it's just the way it goes. Um, uh, hopefully he made it through the season because uh, there's no telling what he'll be this next year. Um, but anyway, it's for me, it, it's kind of one of those things to where my focus is I want it to be a mature deer, you know, um, and whether it's a clean typical eight, whether it's a jacked up coal six point, I mean, I shot, I shot a deer the year before that, um, he was probably, I'd say around six, um, probably close to six and a half. And he had just one like spike on one side. Yeah. A deer that like nobody else would shoot, you know, but I'm like, man, he's, he's an old deer. We don't want his genetics in the pool. So that was the, that was the deer that I shot for the year. Mm -hmm. And, um, cause it's a one buck County. And, um, but to me, it's, it, it's kind of weird. Cause I'm not trying to say that I'm doing it for management purposes because you really can't manage anything that's wild and free, sure. um, you know, and you can't manage the people around you. But, um, I guess for me, I don't want to shoot a young, I don't want to shoot a young deer knowing that their potential to turn to something great would, you know, be cut short. Um, you know, so it's, it's, um, you know, I hunted, um, a lot of, I hunted some public land this year, um, on Lake Grapevine and man, I saw a lot of small bucks, but I was like, man, these deer could turn into something great. And I didn't want to just shoot, a deer just to shoot a deer to go, okay, I shot a deer like grapevine. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, um, I just, um, you know, it, it's, they kind of have to, they kind of have to be the, you know, the mature deer that, that are hard to kill. That's, that's kind of what drives me. It's like, it's, it's almost like a challenge of going, I want to find the oldest, smartest one. And that's the one that I want to, I want to pursue. And if he beats me, then he wins and it just builds the drama for next season. And if someone shoots him, then I turn that attention to the, to the next one that I find, you know? So it's not, I mean, I just enjoy hunting, man. It's, it doesn't matter yeah. to me. Um, you know, I, I enjoy going out and meeting new people that, you know, that also share that same passion with, you know, just picking other hunters brains and learning like how they do things and, um, you know, so for me, it's just, it's just fun. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it can be a spike cause I'm, I'm not too proud to shoot a spike either. <laughs> yeah, no, no, me either. I mean, it's been this, this shift in me the last few years of realizing, Hey, if, if, you know, if I'm practicing Q to M, if I want to shoot mature deer every year, I have to be able to, um, you know, sacrifice shooting the deer that may score the best because I see some stud three-year-olds that are 140 inches. And I'm like, man, this deer is is going to be Boone and Crockett, no doubt. But, um, you know, then you're shooting 110 inch deer at the end of the year. That's six and a half years old. And and that's better than, right. than that one. And that's kind of something I've had to rewrap and rewrite my, how my brain works in that way, because, you know, shooting the bigger deer is obviously sometimes not the best. I want to shoot the oldest, the most mature, the one that's been hunted so many seasons and outsmarted so many people, even if it doesn't have the biggest rack. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's almost like you're pursuing the godfather of the hunting woods, you know, yeah. it's, you're kind of going, man, he's been there. He's seen it. He, he's the most savvy. And, and to me, that's, that's the ultimate chess match, you know, is going, I don't need the, I don't need the 160 year, you know, 160 inch, you know, three and a half year old or four year old, you know, that 
comes in like clockwork every single day. I mean, now granted, depending on what the scenario is, if there's not a big mature buck, um, you know, if that's, if that's your oldest and biggest deer that you have on your property, then I mean, obviously that's a little different story, but, um, you know, it's, it's just, um, you, you just try to find the, the old monarchs out there, man. And I mean, that's, that's what makes it, makes it fun. You know, kind of just builds the, builds the storyline because it's not their first rodeo. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here, which is something I don't, I don't do very much in here, but, uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah. So this is, this is the deer you were talking about earlier, right? The, the one that you thought could have went 190. No, uh, no, no different one. No, uh, go up. Um, man no, or maybe ahead. it wasn't posted uh well i thought i did but maybe i didn't maybe oh, not. oh is that him no 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 it's a video right it's oh video right, here. right here oh my goodness yikes that's yeah, a it, it's it's deceiving it's hard to tell right here on the screen but dude, yeah he's an absolute stud i mean you can see his his beams are you know, his beams are out, you know, even with his nose, which, you know, is typically tells you, you know, you're about 25 inches, you know, from, uh, you know, depending kind of how much they're wrapping right there. But if they're, if they're tip of their beams touching their nose right there, you're, you're figuring you're, you're off to at least a 50 inch start, um, mm -hmm. you know, and he's got good mass. He's got flyers off of both G2s. I mean, uh, you know, split G2s on both sides. I mean, right. he's, he's a stud for sure, but. Yeah, he'll be interesting to see what he looks like this next year because I've seen some pretty good ones shot around here this year, but um, but wasn't none of them were him. Yeah, well, I hope he sticks around for for you next season. I'd like to see you know get another two hundred incher. That'd be awesome. So I feel like uh, you know as as we hunt and we, we get older, um, the priorities kind of change. For me, it used to be shooting a deer, and that's kind of all I wanted. Now it's more of the the whole process. Of, of scouting and and hanging out with friends and family and you know the deer is kind of just the the nice little cherry on top at, at the end you know what is how has that changed for you as you know start to you know spend time with your girls in the outdoors teach them about hunting and stuff like that well you know i'm i'm pretty fortunate my oldest daughter um she shot her first buck when she was 10 uh so a couple of years ago and, uh, and so now, I mean, she, she's hooked, she's my little hunting buddy. And so, um, obviously we were, um, you know, we were trying to, she went hunting with me a few times this year. Um, you know, but it's just, um, man, it, it was, it was tough, just not good movement. Um, you know, where we were hunting and, um, you know, I typically try to take her, um, you know, to a, a place that we used to get to hunt out in, um, out in San Saba and which you know the deer numbers are much higher and so you know for for a, a child or you know for a kid it it makes that much easier for them to sit there and be still when they at least get to see something yeah um, you know but um but we weren't able to hunt that place this year um you know because of covid and and so um my daughter came in and um and hunted with me a couple times at one of our other places and it just you know nothing nothing worth shooting that that we saw and i didn't want her to shoot a doe especially like you know in late season um you know i'm just that's that's not my deal i'm kind of like man once they've been bred yeah you know, i don't want to shoot them at that point it's, you know for me if you're going to shoot one i want to shoot them early in the season um you know before they get bred because that could be the one carrying the next next state record man who knows, who knows? But, but um but yeah so i mean as of as of right now um you know it's got to, you know, go do a little duck hunting and, um, and that's all wrapping up here. And so now we're kind of transitioning into the spring. So I'll, uh, going to go do a little camping. We like, you know, we camp quite a bit as a family. My kids love to do it and my wife loves to do it. And so we'll do a little bit of camping and then, um, then probably toward the end of March, um, probably, uh, I'd say majority of the deer will have their their antlers drop by then and I'll go out and do some shed hunting, just see what I can find from, you know, the bucks over these past seasons and kind of revamp the revamp the trail cameras and start rolling yep. right back into spring food plots. And, and, uh, I'll get out, 
still a little this winter and, and probably try to take out a few more pigs and a few more coyotes and and um you know, my, my, my kids, I, you know, I, I take them pig hunting with me and they, they enjoy that too. So it's, you know, we, overall, we like to, you know, you know, they, they enjoy the hunting of it. Uh, my, my youngest one, she's not too patient. If she's not, too <laughs> she's like, eh, I'm out of here. But, uh, but that's, I mean, we're, we're a pretty outdoors family as it is anyway. So it's, um, it's been good. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, I'm realizing more and more, uh, how much hunting is not a three, you know, little three month sequence throughout the year and how, how you can really keep it going. If you get creative with, you know, the ways you hunt. Yeah, there's, there's always something. And and for me, I, it's pretty much a year round deal. Uh, for one, you know, I, I'm always looking for new places to hunt, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, um, and for two, it's, if it's not going and trying to wipe out the mass, crop of pigs that do nothing but destroy everything we have because that's the problem with planting food plots is the pigs just annihilate them and uh you know so this time of year when it's cold i like to go out and, and just try to i'll take out the ar and just try to start <laughs> down some some pigs and and you know i like to do some some predator control go out and call some coyotes and get them knocked down for fun start hitting the ground in june and um but yeah like i say it's uh, you know, for the most part, all my stands, um, the ones that, you know, are permanent, I think I have in pretty good spots from year to year. Um, you know, but I always keep my mobile stands for, you know, if all of a sudden some scrapes start showing up somewhere and, you know, instead of going and taking down stands and going to all the trouble and, um, you know, work to, to move a permanent stand to where there's a scrape, which might dry up and, nothing's going through that area you know that's when i that's when i'll just do mobile hunts you know on on things like that but um but yeah it's it's always something man i i I love it i I enjoy the process of all of it you know the the sweating out there you know mowing the weed eating the the food plots the hanging stands i mean i i enjoy it all man yeah no it's it's awesome it's a I'm glad we get to enjoy it, but, um, uh, you know, Chad, it's always a, a pleasure having you on, man. Um, thanks for, for jumping on once again. I hope we get to do that Southeast Oklahoma trip this year. If, if COVID quits acting up and maybe you get a little time on a weekend, but, um, where can, where can people connect with you, um, on social media or maybe I, I know you've been doing some stuff on YouTube as well. Yeah. So, um, so my, my Instagram is, um, Chad Allen Jones, which Allen is A L A N. Um, and that's also the same for my Facebook page. Um, and that's also the same for my, uh, YouTube channel and, um, and the profile is the same on all of them. So it makes it easy to, um, to identify, but I'll, I'll warn you ahead of, ahead of time, my YouTube <laughs> channel, it's, it's, a it's a sight for sore eyes, man. Like I say, that's what, that's one thing that I found very difficult is, um, is, being able to film good content but the editing is about to drive me insane and so i'm I'm trying to find somebody that that uh that can do some some editing and so that way i can just hand them a pile of videos and go hey work your magic bro because right because it's i'll get in the middle of them and it, it about drives me nuts trying to you know i just don't have a creative mind for it's like hey i'm real good at going out there and and in hunting them but in terms of the creative mind to capture certain things for for video it's uh that's where i'm i'm struggling but you know that that's that's another thing with it. it's just just learning in progress you know yeah I, well i'm right there with you it's it's hard to put videos together and you know i get home and i'm like oh I, I needed this shot or i should have done this and i'm like and i realize oh i only have one camera angle that's not very interesting to watch for eight minutes and yeah. i'm like gosh dang it yeah, I, I'm learning. I think we're all learning on the YouTube thing. But um, anyways, so if you guys are listening, just go ahead and give it a sub anyways. It's going to get better as as long with and as with mine, too. Um, I'm I'm looking for someone to film to film me and edit that stuff, too, because it's a different world, man. It's like a second job. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, and that's the other thing, too, is trying to trying to kill a mature deer while self filming it is a whole nother is a whole nother level. I mean, that's, uh, you know, because I got that a whole lot. Everyone's like, Oh man, did you, did you film the two thirty that you shot? 
And mm-hmm. I was like, uh, no, I didn't even, I didn't take a GoPro. I didn't take anything. And, um, and they're like, oh man, that would have been epic if you would have had it on video. And I'm like, yeah, but on the flip side of that, if I would have been fumbling with a camera, just trying to get this thing and, and he would have busted me or it made a noise or anything wrong. And I w- wouldn't have gotten the opportunity because I was trying so hard to, to self film it. Then yeah. I would probably throwing all my camera equipment in the, in the Creek and, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, you know, it, it, but it's fun. I mean, it, it's cool to be able to, it is cool to be able to, to video them and relive those moments, you know, because mm-hmm. you can hear people's stories. Um, you know, some of them you're kind of like, man, there's no way that that's really happened, you know, but then, you know, if you, if you got it self filmed, it's, it's, you know, so that, that's something I'm, I'm working on trying to get, trying to get better at. It's just the editing is the different language to me. Yeah. Well, I've noticed too, not only is it fun to, to relive it, but I'll go back and rewatch it while af- right after I shoot a deer and I'm like, Oh yeah, just go ahead and get the deer cart. We're going to be picking this one up in 15 minutes. And then I'm like, Oh, actually uh, I go and look, you know, maybe it's not as good or maybe it's a little bit better, you know, the shop yeah. placement and having that is just invaluable. You know, it's the ability to rewatch it time and time again. And, and, you know, yeah, yeah, that's helped me out a lot. Yeah, for sure, man. But yeah, no, I would, man, we definitely, we got to, we got to get together and get down there and, and go hunt, man. It's, Hey, we only got what? Nine more months. Yeah. Maybe I'm counting down the it. days. Yeah, absolutely. If not, I'll, I'll, I might see you at the jujitsu school sometime. Yeah, for sure, man. You get moved up this way. Give me a holler. We'll, uh, we'll definitely connect somewhere down the road for sure. Yeah. That sounds good, man. Well, uh, thanks for jumping on. I appreciate it as always.